for tuning in this is the about to break podcast the show where we talk to artists and entertainers about the ups and downs of life in the entertainment business uh this episode is a really really fun one recently as you guys know i was in nashville and i was there performing some shows for about a week and while i was there i got a text from my buddy rob balchunas and rob's a, a great performer a balloon artist a juggler he does amazing things and uh I've met him many, many times at Scott Neary's Booby Trap, and then uh, we just we just became buddies. And um, so I'm in Nashville, and I get this text from Rob, and he goes, dude, are you in Nashville right now? And I said, yeah, are you here? And he said, no, but you've got to meet my friend Scott Tripp. Now, if you've listened to this program for any amount of time, you know I've got this little motto that I'm living by that is, life should be summer camp. You know, that great things happen when you just say, uh, I'm here to have fun and I'm here to make friends. I mean, that's what made summer, summer camp awesome, right? Summer camp was awesome because everybody was in it to make friends and to have a good time and to make memories. So when Rob hit me up and goes, hey, you need to talk to my buddy Scott Tripp, I said, let's do it. And so that's what you're about to hear. This is a conversation with Scott Tripp, another incredible balloon artist. Now, when I say balloon artist... Um, Scott even said this on an online video and you can look at it. It's pretty awesome. I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, you know, you hear balloon art and you think, oh, someone's just making a sword or a dog or, you know, it comes across as maybe a hacky thing. What he's able to create with balloons is, is really, truly art. And his art uh, goes even beyond his work with balloons. He does um, incredible paintings and drawings. And uh, I'm going to post some pictures on the show notes of some of his some of his art and a couple pieces that he gave me that I just am so grateful to have in my collection and absolutely love. Uh, but this is a great conversation, guys. We talk about a lot of stuff in here. We go on some great tangents, but they're glorious tangents. And we joke about it throughout. But... Um, it's a great conversation, guys. It's a good reminder that life is beautiful and you can make friends if you're willing to just say yes to opportunity. So before we get into the episode, I want to thank everyone who's been sponsoring us on Patreon, all the producers of the show. We've got 22 different individuals right now who are giving every month, uh, some as little as a dollar, uh, some as much as $50 to offset the cost of producing these shows. And we want to keep bringing more content to you. So we're at 22... Uh, uh, producers right now i've said once we reach 25 i'm going to add a, a bonus episode every week so three more producers away uh we get three more producers i'm going to go ahead and start doing a weekly five minute monday which is just going to be me talking from my heart most of the shows are interviews uh, it's going to be me sharing just kind of where i'm at and some things that i'm doing that are working and really honestly some things that i'm doing that are probably not working at the time um, just as we're committed to transparency and uh, just having real conversations with artists about just trying to do the thing they love for a living. So, uh, guys, I know you're going to love this episode. I am uh, today, if you're listening, the day it comes out, I have jury duty. I don't know what my fate is. I, you know, I, I love that we can be part of the judicial system. And uh, at the same time, I'm scared to death because I am a... Uh, we have a single income family and that comes from me getting on airplanes and going and doing shows and uh, I have shows in the next couple of days and I'm supposed to possibly have jury duty so we'll see how it goes guys Uh, until then that might be my breaking moment but until then sit back relax enjoy episode 89 of the about to break podcast my conversation with Scott Tripp Hey everybody, welcome to About to Break. I'm your host, Taylor Hughes, and this week I'm in Nashville, Tennessee, in the uh, attic loft of a hipster coffee shop, sitting across from Scott Tripp. Thanks for doing this, man. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Welcome to Nashville. Have you been here before? I've been through for like one-nighters for conventions or events, but you know know how it is, man. You you Mm -hmm. get hired to do something and you think, oh, I'm going to go see the city. And all you see uh, is a hotel room, an airport, and an Uber, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so. I went on tour for two years, actually, with Scott Neri, past guest. Yeah. We did uh, 
cross-country tour into Canada for two years, 39 cities each year. Holy moly. Yeah. And, but what happened, and I, if I had to do over again, I would totally do it differently, is we were on a tour bus yeah. and we would go to a city. You'd wake up, you'd see an amphitheater, you'd perform, yeah. get back on the tour bus, go to the next city. <laughs> right. And we took for granted, you know, yeah, this is life now, so we don't have to see everything now. There's plenty of time later. <laughs> right. But what the result of that is, if someone says, hey, have you ever been to, you know, Portland, Oregon? My answer is, I don't know. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like, we've been to so many beautiful things and seen so little. I've called my wife many times after I, you know, I'm getting ready to go to the airport and I tell her, oh, I'm excited. I've never been to this city before. You know, I've never <laughs> been to Asheville, North Carolina or whatever. And then I land on the plane and I walk into the airport and I call her and go, yeah, I've totally been here. <laughs> <laughs> I've eaten at that uh, subway right there. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the flip side too is I don't know if you take vacations and <laughs> I don't do things that aren't related to work. Right. You know, it's like, you know, the old saying, when you make what you love to do your job, you never work a day in your life. Right. I'm going to say the flip side too, though. If you do what you love for a living, you never have a day off. You work every day. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's interesting, So it's interesting, like, we don't man. really do vacations. Yep. So I don't have that tourist thing. It's like yeah. you go to a city, they're like, oh, you're in St. Louis. You have to see the arch. Yeah. It's uh, like, that's not what I want to see, really. I right. want to see what people who live there see. Yeah. I've driven past the arch many times to go to a comic yeah. book store. I'm like, I don't <laughs> yeah. I don't want to go in that elevator. First of all, I don't understand it. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'm sorry, right where we're sitting and we're actually in East Nashville, which is the hipster part of yeah. Nashville. And Nashville is like the it town right now. So right. Oh, yeah. I hate so, to like feed into that, but... I. The graffiti that you see, like on the telephone poles and the dumpsters, right. I think that's more the feel of the city, and that's kind of what I really enjoy the most. By right. the way, when you came in, did you see all the uh, the signs? Someone stapled all the telephone poles. No, no, I um, didn't see them. When it says like compliments are free or something. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> but what was weird about it? And uh, I mean, I see that it's like someone's like, I'll put up a motivational right. poster. But driving down the street, it was on every single pole for several blocks and i'm trying to like put myself in the shoes of the person who did that right it's like i get it if you put one up you're like hey that was fun you put up two yay right. this was seriously i mean it had to be two or more hours and that's just what i saw i don't know how what the coverage was i love that something that uh meant like started off as like oh this is going to be an encouragement and you're like oh that's kind of cool and then you see another one and then you're just annoyed yeah <laughs> you're like, well, you're it's like off. i'm not annoyed and i, I don't know why it's like Big things don't really impact me, but small things do. Right, yeah. Um, and yeah, I wish it wasn't that way. I'm not saying, oh, I'm interested. Like when people say, oh, I don't own a TV. I'm like, no, I know this is the flaw that I have. Right, It's right. like little things I'm going to obsess over. So I'm right. like, I see that was a positive message. And they're like, yeah, I'm going to put something positive out in the world. That's where it should have ended. But in my head, I'm like... <laughs> the repetition shows like this almost sense of like urgency and sadness, like a cry for help. Right. Even. Now I'm stressed. I got to pull over and <laughs> compliment someone or else something's going to happen, you know? Yeah. So I don't, you know, <laughs> yeah, I always make it weird. I always take it dark. Sorry. No, about that. <laughs> I love it, man. Oh, speaking of gestures, I, I love, you were the first guest, I think. I think oh. you were the first guest to bring me a gift. And this is oh, a very wow. cool gift. This book uh, is called Double Deuce. Tell me a little bit about this artist. I know we talked a little bit about it, for, but for folks who maybe okay. haven't heard him. So this is Aaron Kamabus. He's one of my uh, big influences. You know, I kind of have this thing where I, I talk to other balloon people and I try to, I guess, teach like more creativity, individualism in balloon right. art. And I don't know if this is a place to get into all of that. It's, but This I is the exact like, place to okay. get into it, yeah. I tried to articulate this to someone earlier, and I use like weird metaphors that make no sense, and then I confuse myself. But I was trying to explain the difference in how you should um, absorb your influences. Oh yeah. Um, like the, I said, the difference is like pickles and smoothies. They're both right. I mean, you should right. live on a diet of pickles and smoothies. Obviously, you know this. Yeah, totally. But like <laughs> the whole like pickling process is like being the cucumber, absorbing the brine or vinegar or whatever right. until it becomes who you are and you can't be separated from that. Um, and I think that's easy to say, you know, I watch Saturday Night Live. I watch, you know, Ren and Snippy, whatever you enjoy. And right. you kind of, you catch yourself like using the catchphrases or you're like, yep. and to a point where you can't stop sometimes. Right. And then the smoothie aspect is like when you're more intentional and you take like 15 of your favorite things. Which little can, of this, little of that. Yeah, it's yeah. like, I like vintage Halloween costumes. I also like, you know, domino toppling world records. And yeah, I like, yeah. you know, like unrelated things. Put those in a smoothie, mix it up, drink it up, yum. 
So it's like everything kind of you have like the overall flavor of it, but you're yes. not like stealing and and stuff. in the process, it's uh, it's some it's you've created something new using all these influences. Right. You're not just you're just not just copying you know directly a, sure. an artist or. Yeah. So I know I'm circling way back around. So that's now the yeah. Aaron Comet bus thing. He's the uh, the person who I actually have to try hard to make sure I'm not copying. Mm. So just because you I, relate so well to what he he does, or yes, and to put out there who Aaron Comet Bus is, he's sort of the um, the late ninety or I guess all of nineteen nineties version of like a Jack Kerouac on the road sort of yep. uh, personal writing. Um, but he also at one point was my favorite artist, author, and musician. Yeah, he's in like several different bands. He was in Pinhead Gunpowder with Billy Joe from Green Day, so oh, it's kind, wow. of kind of that that flavor. Yep, yep. Um, but yeah, I also like. Okay, I'm not a musician. You're in Nashville right now with me. Right. I'm probably one of two people in, in this, this building that, <laughs> that can't play guitar. <laughs> right, right. And to me, <laughs> I like that because if I listen to music that's off key, yeah. I, I have no idea. Right. So to me, it's like that ignorance makes music magical to me. You enjoy it like a, yeah. like a magic trick when you don't know the secret. Right. But even deeper, it's like I like terrible music. <laughs> <laughs> like. But What's, I enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> sincerely. Um, so I do like if, like, in the middle of a song, like the singer burps or whatever, or, you right. know, it's like at the end of an FYP song, um, I can't think of the name of the song off the top of my head, but it's like you hear the vocalist say, okay, I think I messed up, but I don't care. Yeah. It's like yeah. as it fades out. There's something, I, I was listening to, uh, I was listening to an old Sinatra record recently, mm -hmm. and they left in, on this record, they left in, the, like, five different takes yeah. Leading up to that one, um, love that, and it's great yeah. because you hear them start it, and you hear one of the horns go sharp, and then he uh -huh. starts over, and then you hear it, and Frank forgets one of the words, yeah. and he starts over, and it it reminded me, you know, years ago, you would record to tape or you would record to film. Everything wasn't digital, so film was precious, yeah, you sold. know. So, yeah. and it was like there was something about that analog recording of it not being perfect that is right. why i think a lot of the classics stick with us yeah. and then now everything's so digital that artists often have a hard time replica replicating it live because it's been so filtered and processed and all of this and yeah we're we're kind of trying to get over um this period of time when everything's so easy it's like i don't know on my phone i'm not the guy that takes selfies but right. um i have Gosh, I don't want to be phone guy and actually open my phone right now. No, go I've for it. I've got anywhere between two and 4,000 photos on my phone. Yeah. Oh, my God, 12,573. 12, <laughs> um, if this was 35-millimeter film that we had to develop, right. I would not have that many photos. No way. So it's like everything kind of loses if, okay, I'm being grumpy old get-off-my-lawn guy right no, now. No, no, no. But... I, I don't think I don't think it's an issue of trying to uh, you know look at a new generation and downplay yeah. what they're doing. It's it's trying. I mean, I talk about this in my show constantly. It's trying to find wonder in a world that Google's everything. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> you just pulled out a can of something. Oh, yeah. Okay, this <laughs> is, is a, lunch for later. I carry a lot of stuff in here. This is a weird art project. Um, I do balloons for a living. Right. So I kind of I feel like you still have to have a hobby so you don't burn out. Yes. Even though I. I know they say you shouldn't define yourself by what you do. But right. I do. But we do. Yeah. I, I can't turn off that. Which but means I've, you probably work a lot because if you're not working, then are you are you really the guy or no? Oh, gosh. All right. So <laughs> I didn't I'm going to take to, us uh, off track there. Yeah. You, now, this is the off track podcast, right? right it is. I hope this so because you've got the wrong guy. Otherwise. Right. This is it. <laughs> okay. So going back to the obsessing over tiny things. Yeah. Um, I got into art, like painting, drawing, stuff like that. Yep. Um, for like different weird reasons, like for sincerely appreciating it. But then I also wanted to do stuff, not so I could say, I want to try my hand at being an artist, but right. I thought I want to experience the art I'm seeing through the, uh, the feel of the paintbrush in my hand, almost oh, like a cool. needle in a, uh, a record groove. Right. Yep. Um, so I started doing like watercolor and watercolor to me was cross training. I'm okay. like, you learn about how colors go together and stuff. So it's not balloons, but I feel like lessons you learn from one thing can be extrapolated can be to another. Yeah. So take all that plus my need to 
constantly punish myself with terrible projects. <laughs> this is, oh, okay, another gift for you. Sorry, you have to, are you flying, driving? I'm flying, but I've got room. Dude, I hope so. All right, this yeah. is a can of chopped yellow balloon dog. Oh my goodness, this is for me? Well, of course. I mean, oh, okay, dude. I didn't want to oh give you things gosh. that you have to like keep up with, like worthless items. Oh, I love this so much. <laughs> Guys, I will post a picture of this for you all to uh, see, but this is, this is a, 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 can was this a, a can of okay yes what was this can originally because right. now yeah. it is a custom <laughs> hand drawn <laughs> beautiful piece of art I'm i don't even i gotta i gotta post a picture of it okay this is how we're chasing butterflies please here. do it the reason i I'm, love the ingredient list <laughs> oh there's five different flavors okay what i did the reason behind this project is i do so much stuff that's like handmade and i'll put you know 12 hours into a a small project right. i thought I want to make something that's more of an addition so I can send out more things to more people. Right. So I made five different flavors, 25 copies of each. Uh, by the way, yours is misnumbered. Sorry about that. It's like number five out of 25, not 12. Oh, I love because it. Because simple math. I got lost on what number. Is it four or five? How high did I count before I messed up? This is number five. I got to five before I <laughs> lost count. Are. That is ridiculous. <laughs> um, actually, I pulled that out because I was looking for some photos I have in my backpack, and that's what was on top. So oh my this is goodness. like the weird clutter lifestyle. So I... um. I started mailing stuff to people, and then I did Just a... Um, art, artwork that you would create, and you'd send well, them something. No, actually, where it started, and I'm sorry, every this is Star Wars. It's like there has to be three prequels before the first one. Right. So I'm like backing the story way up. Go for it. Um, with balloons, I kind of always felt this need to contribute, and I want to put a disclaimer there. It's not that I wanted my name out there to say, you know, this is what I've accomplished. But I felt like I had to contribute because I wanted to be part of what was happening. Huh. And I've talked to one of my friends, Sam Cremines, if he's listening, I need to shout him out. Yep. Um, that it's not that I want accolades, but when the yearbook comes out, I don't want to see, you know, you know, photo not taken or whatever. Right. It's like, you want to be you a part of the conversation. It. Yeah. It's not for the ego, but it's because you want to experience, you know, the moment. Yes. It's like, you want to say, I was at Woodstock. No, I wasn't on stage. No, my name's not there, but right. I got to experience the joy with everyone around me. Right. And you have a story from your perspective. You know, I stayed yeah. by this dumpster and this thing happened and you've got the dumpster uh -huh. story from Woodstock. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like so that's where all this started. So I started off by trying to find what do I have to contribute. So I did a, uh, a small publication. I'm going to say is like sub magazine. I actually had uh, two copies, full color printed, like maybe 200 copies of each. So it was oh pretty low stakes yeah but it's the kind of thing i really enjoy doing yeah. so i kind of put it out there because i'm like all right here's my voice that maybe i can contribute mm. but when i started mailing the first ones out i would uh put all this time into the artwork like the book you have how it's all handwritten there's right. like no type yeah like this this yeah this is not like every page on this is handwritten <laughs> i love that you did that i love it's that amazing. weird self-punishment but it's it's also like you feel the sincerity. You feel the fingerprints in it. Right, yeah. But like we were saying with the uh, the analog, it's like you want to feel the soul of the artist in there. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry. Bring me back. Because I I'm will off bring you back. Topic. Yep. Um, do you know the sculptor uh, Rodin? He did The Thinker. You know yes. The Thinker. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's this thing about his sculptures. Uh, listen to a podcast on this. Um, the Rodin Touch. I'm probably pronouncing his name wrong. That's fine. Um, no one knows. <laughs> but yeah, but the sculptures you see, like if there's a bronze sculpture, yeah. that's not what he made because he sculpted in clay, had it fired, it was in bronze. Less, you're seeing an addition in okay, a way. Okay, yeah, yeah. Like if you buy a print Even from someone. it's technically the final product, that's right. not what he put his hands to. Right, and you don't yeah. really think about that when you see the sculpture. Right. So what happened with him, from my understanding from you know a podcast, I'm not saying I have a training in art. No, I'm, you know. Yeah. I'm dumb, so I listen to other people. I'm like, hey, here's a good story. <laughs> Is that there's something they call the rodent touch, where okay. he would actually place like thumbprints in the clay, which would be fired in the bronze. So it gives, oh. not to be an artificial touch, but so when you see it, you feel like it's more relatable. Yep. Because you want to feel the artist in the artwork. Right. Like, um, uh, who's a good example? Like Andy Warhol's uh, soup, yep. yeah, um, yeah. Oh, soup yeah. cans. Yeah, totally. He wanted to have his fingerprint removed from it. You look at it, it's like silk screened. Yep. Like there's artwork he never touched because he right. had a factory, like right. Jeff Koons does now. Yep. And then there's other people like you want to see that fingerprint, like huh. uh, Jackson Pollock, the splatter painting. Yep. It's like you want the fingerprint more than the artwork because right. that is that, what it is. Yep. So where was I? Okay. You were talking so, about when you first started sending these <laughs> yes. out. So the publication yeah. was that for me. It's like I wanted it to have as much of. What I have to do, it's like as an artist, you're like, I'm going to cut myself open and bleed for everyone. It's like, right. I want you to see what's inside. Yeah. So I put every ounce of everything into every page and even more than that. Yeah. Then I put it in an envelope, addressed it. And I'm like, 
this is a yellow envelope. Yeah. It's like the most soulless for right. what's inside. Right. So I started adding like little doodles. Like yeah. I draw something with Sharpie while I'm standing in line at the post office. Okay. And then I started, as I was saying with watercolor, here's how like beginner weird I was. I started like watercolor on yellow manila envelopes, which yep. does not work. Watercolor is okay. like so transparent. Right. You know, it's not the right Everything medium. It looks a little yellowish. And then people started commenting on the artwork. And then I would have people say, oh yeah, I've got your envelope up in my office. I'm like, that is terrifying, yeah. flattering, but horribly terrifying. Well, how wonderful that the, the, the envelope oh, was know. supposed to be the container, yeah. and now it is the thing that people keep and love. And I know I sent it to someone, but there's that moment where it's like, no, that's like you read my diary. But you know, yeah. that's like a silly way to look at it. But what happened is it started this almost like an arms race with myself. I'm like, well, now I'm going to you know, spend more time on the envelope, more time. Yeah. Bringing out my phone. You guys are listening Here to the audio. But I'm going to show you some I'm gonna pictures. I'm going to have him send me these um, pictures so we can share yeah. some. If that's so right. the first cans of these have not gone out yet. Yeah. But I started like making my own art, mailing out stuff. I've done some uh, DVDs for balloon people. Yeah. Mailing those out. And I would like ramp up the artwork a little bit more every time. And right now I'm living... I'll just say living alone. I've got two roommates, but I have the, uh, I'm living the bachelor life. So yeah. I went to bed at 6.30 yesterday morning, this morning, I guess. Oh, this morning. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> That's why I texted you. What time are we meeting? Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, I live a garbage lifestyle. I'm up till well, 6.30, but. Well, that's, you know, being entertainers as well, our schedules are so weird normally. And then if you do any socialization outside of that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I did get home at midnight, but that's no excuse for how late I went. Right. Um, but I also found that these things we do that are hard to describe to people, like how much time I will spend working on a box to mail someone. Yeah. Is, it's something that any normal person like would say. How, how much time have you spent on a box before? I'm actually looking up two specific ones I want to show you because yeah. after each one of these, I'm like, okay, you know what? That is the end. It's time to get back to being a human, <laughs> which I did not do in either instance. Um, I love it. But yeah, the people who will tell you, you know, that's ridiculous. You could be working on booking more shows, which I know is what I should be doing. <laughs> um, those people are asleep yeah. from midnight to 4 a.m. And that's, that's when true. I can't hear their voices. Right. <laughs> um, and that's oh, when you do all of this. Oh, my. I see them, too, now. Okay. I'm going to back up here. I'm going to show you. I want to show these in order. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So these are from a project I did. I had a... This is going to sound terrible. A fundraiser for myself. <laughs> oh, that's, I want to okay. hear all about that. <laughs> yeah, well, let me tell you about that, actually, because one of the... I have a few shout-outs that are very important to me. Like, Absolutely. I don't want this to go out if I don't properly thank these people. And I don't know if I can actually say this online, so I'm shouting out the entire circus. And yeah. I know who they are. <laughs> the whole circus. All the circus people. Yes. Um, it's not like it's an underground group, but these are my people. Um, right. They're the people who I look to for everything and run every idea past them before they go out into the world. Um, so these are kind of the people that have my back. Um, yeah, go for it. Some people that maybe, I think I've, there's only one person I've not physically met before. Okay. But like, I will give them the, you know, my bank pin number or let them drive my car. You know, I trust wow. these people more than, you know, anyone else in the world. Right. So to say that they're like my best friends, it's kind of like saying, you know, when someone's cat dies, you're like, oh, it's just a cat. But yeah, for some no, people, it's like, some cats are just cats. Some cats are more than a family member. Right, right. So, yeah, that's who these people are to me. So, we did one fundraiser for someone for uh, something unrelated. And then I had something coming up and I needed to quickly raise money for. And what's great is you don't have to ask. It's like, everyone's like, okay, here's what we're going to do. Right. So, they helped me put on a webinar, which uh, helped me raise money for some... Uh, some legal stuff. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I didn't get arrested. It's not that kind of legal <laughs> stuff. Um, so I wanted to send out a thank you to everyone. So I made these two, like, you know, prayer candles, the glass candles. Yep, yep. Oh, yeah. So I made two of those each with, like, different labels on them that were inside jokes. Right. And mailed those to everyone. So the first one I put, you know, time into the letter and a little time into the uh, the box. And right. the second one I put a little bit more time into the box. Um I wanted to show you the third one. I couldn't find it. I don't want to stall while I'm looking on the phone. No, this is uh, great. So this is the fourth one. There's six sides to a box. That's side one. Oh, my one. goodness. This one, this I think... This is like a... Comp imagine like a complete... You can scroll. And there's, there's no embarrassing photos okay. on that phone, by the way, so don't worry. Oh, my goodness. That's this the is... box. That's not what's inside the box. Yeah. 
This is Uncle Yellow's Ant Farm, and it has a picture yeah. of of two very lovely ants <laughs> on here. And it, it just imagine like a completely like like a package you would design for a product. You made this to send a gift to someone. I mean, it's got a custom barcode. There's there's graphics on here, and 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 it's all hand drawn. Right. I'm still trying to, you know. This sounds weird to say. I'm trying right. to understand why I do what I do. <laughs> By the way, you guys, if you're listening right now, go to the show notes. I'll have a link there. We'll put these on the uh, on the show page if if that's all right. I'd love people oh, to all be means. able to see this. It's phenomenal. And I realize that this is like all like weird stuff. Wow. I should be embarrassed to put out in the world, but um, I think what it is like I'm just now articulating this as I'm saying it out loud. Yeah, is I think there's something like if you bring your wife flowers, yeah, like on your anniversary, it's expected. Or right. she tells you, you know, I really wish you'd bring me flowers, and you right. do. It means nothing. But if you bring it and it's not expected is when it means more. Oh, yeah. So that's why I kind of feel like the design on the box the packaging, is something yeah. that should not take time. But if you put time into that, maybe it means something. But that's that's so incredible. I mean, you. when did this start happening? I mean, you, uh, you've done <laughs> balloons for years and years, right? But uh, I have. We are all broken people in some way. That's what led us to what we do, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. That's even worse. That's like the uh, progress. Oh my before it's goodness. all cut out. So. so you're so you're actually making the box as well. You're, oh gosh. I didn't right. realize that. Like I you know, know this you is... took a box <laughs> and you colored it. You literally created the <laughs> I feel like I'm talking to a therapist. I'm like, all right, actually the sickness runs deeper. <laughs> okay. But Go I, ahead. Mean, I enjoy the process too though. <sighs> um I think as we were saying with the uh, the tactile, like right. you want the the mistakes in there. Oh, by the way, this is a very mainstream one. If you guys, everyone knows who Green Day is. Right. They did the, uh, was it Time of Your Life, Good Riddance, that song that was uh, a big radio hit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, I'm not going to sing it for you. You'd recognize it. Yeah. I think that starts off with two like bad takes and then it goes into the song. Right, It's like, yeah. that's my favorite part of the song. Oh, it's fantastic. Um, Love that personal fingerprint. So to me, growing up analog, I love getting mail. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. Like, and it, even now today, it's like even more important. Like, it's like a gift. You know, you have that like four-year-old, you know, someone hands you a wrapped gift. You're like, you know, that's the most exciting thing that could ever happen. Oh, yeah. So even if you order something, yep. it's like opening the mailbox and seeing something there. Yeah. Otherwise, you're Charlie Brown and you didn't get a Valentine. You know, <laughs> it's like every day you check the mail and there's only bills. You're right. Like, you know, what are we even doing on oh, this yeah. planet? You have to have that little moment of happiness. So I'm like, yeah, if you make the envelope a little bit more colorful and bright and pop out, that's kind of fun too. And this is ridiculous. Okay, this is silly to say that no, I I'm don't recognize it. that people look at this. Because, yes, I do spend like 7, 12 hours on one box. But to hear people say, I saved the box. I don't know why, but I'm like, I, right. that's the last thing I expected to hear. So I dropped off a box, and um, the person at the post office says, oh, yeah, we love this. We always, uh, the people here, we always show it to each other. And I'm like, what? Yeah. You know, not that I feel like my privacy was invaded, but I'm like, A, I should have absolutely known, you know, people looking at stuff, but B, right. I absolutely had never, the thought didn't it, cross my it mind didn't in any think way. About you. It'd just be like another package or? Yeah. And I don't know why I'm like that, <laughs> like dense to not even think about. Well, I mean, when you look at these, I mean, it, it stands out immediately. I can understand as an artist and as you're creating it, maybe you're just like, oh, it's just a thing I'm doing for someone. But anyone who looked at that would stop in their tracks and go, I've never seen this before. Yeah. And. I mean, this is a whole different topic, but I think, like, in general, I mean, in art and everything, but in general, intent is more important, I think, than what you, I guess, like, compliments. It's like, mm -hmm. what, why you say something or what's behind it is more important than the words sometimes, maybe, right. if that makes sense. So, I don't know if you, like, look at artwork sometimes and you see something that's being soulless, you're like, why is this artist famous? And then you see something that's so much better, like... I don't know. We were talking about like graffiti. Right. You know, you see one thing, you're like, that is amazing. Right. It's like, it's a lower level. You're not supposed to enjoy it more, but you do. It just kind of hits you differently. Yep. Um, well, I, I mean, speaking of graffiti in LA, some graffiti I love and some of it is just chicken scratch, you know, quick. You can tell they're trying to quickly put something up before they get caught. Yeah. And I think part of it is probably the same reason... You know, the same same way I feel about the graffiti is probably the same same thing that comes across with like these boxes and the envelopes you're creating is you can look at a piece and go, that took someone time. 
you're you're not just it's not just the thought that counts. I think when people say that, oftentimes it's realizing, oh, you <laughs> spent time on me. Maybe yeah. you know what I mean, like right. The, okay, I'm sorry. I've, there's like twelve things I want to say at once. Do them all. all. Do them all. Sense. Oh, I'm gonna forget at least ten of them. <laughs> um, but I I kind of made a piece with bad art. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a case for bad art. All right, like the graffiti. If you see something like, oh, they're just copying, trying to copy Banksy, or they're right. trying to copy you know whoever. I think that that's. It's easy to make fun of, and okay, yes, you should make fun of them a bit. Okay, no, you should make fun of them, because for me, being mocked if I have a bad show is my motivation to do better. Mm. And I grew up as a street performer. Actually, uh, Scott Neri, um, Mike Menace, I don't know if he still performs. Um, I kind of put Rob Altunas in the same category. We've not performed together. Right. But I feel like we mock each other in a loving way. And that well, and that's part of life when you're a yeah. street performer. I mean, you you hear all sorts of things from the crowd. Right? Yeah. I mean, oh, and you're like, oh, that joke was hilarious. It was more funny when Peter Panic did it or whatever. <laughs> you know, it's like, so having someone bust you like that makes you, you know, realize that's the worst transgression. I'm not going to do it again. Right. Um, so, yeah, that's why I think the case for bad art. Yes, do mock it. But also it's part of the process. You start by copying. Yep. And actually, I was having this conversation with someone else earlier. You start by copying, but you can never copy your heroes the best they, that you can. Right. So your copy falls short, but it's in those flaws in your copy that you start to find yourself, and mm-hmm. then you kind of go off on that. So when you see like bad art, bad copies, a lot of times that's just you're catching someone on the front end of their process. So yeah. it's kind of like you don't want to dismiss them. Yeah. You're just kind of, you're in a different place. Yep. Um, oh, also, but the case with bad art. There is a lot of artwork. I'm sorry. I'm going to tangent this tangent on top of that tangent. No more apologies from me, <laughs> my friend. There, oh. there is no tangent. This is a uh, a stream of conscious okay. thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, you know what? I'm going to break the broken mold. <laughs> so there are certain artists who I just never liked. Yeah. And instead of continuing to not like them, I had this this idea that I would start like reading a biography of an artist I don't like. Kind of. Yeah find out more about who they are and it'll either change my mind or it'll confirm either way I gave them a chance you know yep. it's like let them take the stand if they're in court don't just you know dismiss them yeah let them hear you hear their case okay this is going to be very unpopular to say this out loud this is like telling a musician I don't like the Beatles Do it. I never liked Picasso oh, I yeah. dislike Picasso right yeah borderline I hated it. maybe hated yeah um, so I've been reading his biography and I'm like okay as a person he was a terrible person right. I do get some of the artwork now um <laughs> I never liked that general abstract art, the artwork you make fun of when you say, oh, my five-year-old could do better, or right. someone painted a canvas green. You know, that's not art. You know, that's like just mocking yourself, right. you know, yeah. mocking art. I've never liked that sort of thing. And then I actually did a booking, and I was there as a balloon person, so it's funny how it all ties right. back in together. And I did this with several different local people, so they were there at the same moment. It was a wedding that was held in a, a large house. Yeah. And there was a lot of artwork on the wall. It's like a strange, crazy amount of artwork. And I started looking at it, and I recognized some of the names as originals. Like I was reading a book on Red Grooms, who is a, a Nashville artist, Nashville slash New York. Right. And it's like I was just reading his biography, and I know some of his original artwork on the wall. So I was like, oh, I'm going to take a closer look. And I see like an original Kandinsky like drawing on paper. Yeah. I'm like, okay. I'm going to remember some artist names. I'm going to you know, kind of start researching this stuff. Once again, it's artwork I, I'm not into. Right. But you figured, let me learn yeah, it's like, a little bit more about the person and see. And it's, a lot of it's like, and this isn't insulting, it's just straight up, looks like doodles you would do on your notebook in middle school. Right. And I started looking it up, and then I actually found the name of the guy's house because he wrote a book on it. He's actually the foremost collector of abstract American art from the 1930s and 40s. Oh, wow. And <laughs> the guy who literally wrote the book. So I'm looking at this stuff. I'm like, I've always hated this. So I'm going to give, you know, this artist, you know, his day in court. Right. And I started to get the feel for it. And then that would lead me to another artist. And it would spider web out. And it's like now this artwork that I like viciously hated became like what I'm really the most into. Yeah. And I think because art should have a meaning, should have a message to speak to, and there's actually direct experiences here where it did speak to me. And then the discovery, yeah. like, I actually got an F in art class. I remember I got a... Okay. What was the reasoning? What was the reasoning for the fail in art? You know, I'm going to just totally vulnerable here and explain. I failed art class with a 69, 70 was D, 69 was F. One point. One point. 
And that actually missing that credit caused me to repeat a year in high school for wow. that point. And it's funny because actually when I found out the grade, I went to the art teacher. I was like, okay, I'm not asking for leniency, but if there's any extra work I can do on top of everything to bring this up. And he's like, right. I will think about that. And came back to me a week later. He's like, I saw that you didn't apply yourself in other classes. So it's not like, you know, you were trying. So he's like, so I'm not going to give you the opportunity. Wow. And that was the whole thing. It's like going through high school. Everything I got was either the 100 or zero. I'm sure right. a lot of people who are listening to this were the same way. Yep. It's like you were good at what you applied yourself at, terrible, or you just didn't turn in the work that you didn't turn in. Right. Yeah, yeah. So that was my whole high school experience. Um, now at this point, bring me back. <laughs> <laughs> no, we were talking, we were talking about um, bad art, like the value of bad art that, that you can. Right. You were studying some of these different artists that you didn't like. Right. And then you said, oh, okay, let me go, let oh. me go learn about them a little bit. Closing the loop on that tangent. Right. So there was a guy, I think Robert Ryman. Okay. Who sold a painting. No, the other book I was going to bring, I thought about. Yeah. Have you heard of, do you know the, uh, the twelve million dollar shark book? No. Okay, that that's one to look up. It's I didn't know if it fell into that artist performing sort of category of a book someone had. Most of us have read. Yeah. Basically, what it does is it tries to justify the um, high price of different artworks. Okay. Specifically, the book is named after the um, the Damien Hirst. He had a dead shark in a tank of formaldehyde that sold at auction for $12 million. Whoa. And now it's like something crazy higher than that. And people look at that and you're like, this is just a joke for the sake of it being a joke. And the book yeah. breaks down what justifies the cost and yeah, and not to get too deep into that, but it's so easy for us as artists to say, you know, that stuff is a joke. It's not real art. Or it's, not, like, or it's not valuable or worth yeah. showing to an audience. Or. I'm like, okay, you're totally valid in your opinion if you listen to both sides first. Right. And listen to both sides and by all means, keep your opinion. And yeah. you're, you're, you're not wrong. You're totally right. Right. Um, but no, I was reading that and there's a guy, uh, Robert Ryman. I think he was local here. His son also does artwork too, so I hope I'm saying the right guy. I think it's Robert Ryman Sr. Jr. Okay. He has a uh, a canvas that is something like twelve by twelve inches and is painted solid black. Yeah, it's like a monochromatic painting. Okay, and it sold at auction, and I don't know the exact number, so I'm hesitant to say, but it was multi millions of dollars. Wow! And you see that, and you're like, people with too much money who don't know what to do with it. Right. I'm like, yeah, that's totally true. And then I like read the the case for it, and it's like that painting, you know, hung in a prominent place in a certain museum and it meant this and it meant that, et cetera. Right. By the same token, um, there is a like one by two and a half inch square of cardboard with a picture of a baseball player on it that sold for one and a half million dollars and that's right. fine. Right. So and we it's don't not think twice artwork. about that. We're like, oh, well, that's yeah. special and it's rare, but. And, I mean, it's like a dirty baseball that someone wrote on. I right. mean, if his name was Babe Ruth, that's good. If it's right. not, it's worthless. Wow. So that's not like where some of that comes from. Yeah. So, I mean, case for bad art. And, oh, by the way, it's something else I want to get to. Um, we're looking at the paintings downstairs, and I I was trying to buy the painting off the wall, but yeah. I guess not many people buy the artwork so here because he's like, I don't know like, the process yeah, of they, selling the artwork. They, they, yeah, they have <laughs> artwork hanging on the wall, some really cool stuff, and you saw a piece you liked and wanted yeah. to buy it, and they're like, we don't know how to sell it. Like, <laughs> Yeah, it's like the bookstore saying, well, people just read books and leave right. them on the table. Yeah, they gotta, don't buy them. you got to call the manager. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm curious about this as you talk about the case for bad art as far as like created pieces. What would you say about, is there a case for bad performance art? Like Whoa. bad magic shows and bad comedy and bad balloon artists because oh, as, as you were speaking, and I do want, I want you to have a chance to answer that, but as you were speaking, I was just so encouraged because th there are people who are listening and they're going to be like, oh, Scott does balloons. I know what that is because they saw mm -hmm. someone who learned seven different balloon figures and now makes, makes good money doing those same seven balloon figures. And it's nowhere near how you approach it as an artist or how I try to approach magic or how Scott Neary would approach juggling. You know what I mean? And yeah. What, uh, what, would, what would you think about that? Is, that? is that translate to performance art? Okay. I love this the most because I've given zero thought to this. Yeah. So I'm giving you the answer that, oh, by the way, 
24 hours from now, I may have completely opposite opinions on most oh, of what I'm oh, saying. Oh, we should. We should be always <laughs> growing and learning and thinking different. But That's fine. Yeah, I will actually have arguments with myself, and I know this sounds like a mental illness. Yeah. Oh, my God, it might be. But um, <laughs> like, I, 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 would always, I would always say that our competition is not other good performers. Right. Our competition is bad performances or people who don't treat it like an art or like a real job. Mm. So where, where would you land with that? Maybe you could... Okay. Um, just kind of going off the top of my head first, I want to say that I am not a performer or I guess what you would say, entertainment guru. Like I will go to Scott Neri because he knows the ins and outs of how to work an audience. And I, I've known Scott for, actually, I have met Scott once since he moved to LA. I knew him like before that. Yeah. Um, and it was fun to see the process of, you know, how we approach stuff. And I love it, too, because we're not carbon copies. Right. It's like we do have a lot of, like, goofus and gallant with stuff. <laughs> and my uh, current roommate, who I, I do, like, a YouTube show with, and we do a lot of things together. Yeah. Um, we're the same way. We're opposite in so many ways. Yeah. I actually, at one point, said, I think we're in that Fight Club situation where you don't exist. <laughs> and I'm going to find out you're my Tyler Durden, That's which is fantastic. funny. Yeah. I told him that, and he's like... What he took away from that conversation is, oh, I'm Brad Pitt. <laughs> and he still tells people, I don't know. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you hear what you want to hear. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. So I'm just going to say off the top of my head. As yeah. an entertainer, I learned about myself, one of my weaknesses. And it's important, I think, to have a, an honest self-audit from time to time. Oh, totally. And Absolutely. honesty with yourself is really hard. Yep. But you have to see, what am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? And one thing, and this is putting my vulnerability totally out there for the world. Um, not proud of my flaws. I mean, knowing your weakness is a strength, I guess. Yeah. But one of my weaknesses is I have a tendency to hide behind my props. Yeah. When I'm doing a magic show, absolutely. Yeah. Balloons, a lot less. I feel more comfortable with balloons in my hand. Right. But I do feel like when I'm on a stage, um, my shows typically are not magic or balloons, but it's kind of a, a combination of at least magic balloons juggling, you know. Yeah. I'm not going to say I try to do a vaudeville show, but yep. if I'm doing a library show and there's, you know, 150 kids in the audience, I want to put the variety in there. Right. Totally. And for them as much as for me too. Yeah. Um, so I would learn that I do hide behind props in the way that I think a stand-up comedian might want a handheld microphone. Yep. You can use a lavalier, but the handheld <laughs> microphone is that crutch. Yeah. And I found that sometimes with magic specifically, I hold the prop, I kind of try to hide in the shadow as the um, the magic moment happens and takes yep. the spotlight, yep. takes the applause. Or even if I have a volunteer, it's like, you know, always make your volunteer the star, have applause for them. Yep. At the end of the show, I always say, you know, be sure to thank the librarians, a big round of applause for them, right. or thanks to the birthday child for inviting us to their party. Yep. So I do think I hide a lot, and this is all just a disclaimer to say I'm not a performance person. <laughs> um it's like I loved the art and then performing was the second step, the necessary evil. And then I got to the point where I could enjoy that with, I, I don't like to uh, put balloons and magic into the different categories, but right. but they are, if Go I'm honest. It. Yeah, totally. Uh, tonight I'm working three hours at a restaurant where I'm going to, from table to table to interrupt strangers who are eating a meal <laughs> to yes. basically solicit. Yeah. And I'm, totally comfortable and enjoy that because I know that situation in and out. I know what I have to bring to the table. Right. And and you know you're going to provide them with something that even if they don't know that they want it or think that they want it, at the end of it, they're going to think it was great and have right. a good time. And I'm going to say, and this is devoid of magic. This isn't magic bashing, but right. this isn't in the, you know, when I show them how I can change their card into the Ace of Spades, they will remember that magic moment and it will bring a <laughs> smile. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. Yeah, no. What I'm saying is, <laughs> no. as I used to try to hide the weird, broken aspects of myself, I'm kind of learning that it's okay to push some of that to the forefront. Right. I've realized recently, I talk to strangers. <laughs> yeah. Like, more than I should. And, like, in a weird way, I can ask deep questions, but not shallow ones. Yeah. So I will have conversations with the cashier at a gas station on just like weird, deep things, but I'm also afraid at the same time to say simple things. Okay. Example, bring me back, by the way, tangent. <laughs> um, so <laughs> my girlfriend so is the most beautiful person I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. And I'm not saying, no, most beautiful to me. Right. I'm not saying like the most beautiful person I know. Right. No, I'm saying like anyone I've ever seen in a movie, on TV, in a magazine, she is literally the most beautiful person I've ever seen in the world. Yeah. 
I'm kind of afraid to tell her that, which is weird. It's like she knows, and right. I know she knows. But it's like saying the words, you're beautiful, in my head discounts those words. Uh-huh. If that makes sense, it's yep. almost like using a stock line right. to describe something that should be a deep emotion. <laughs> and I tell her that too. That's good. That's good. That's good. Yeah, you got to tell her that. Um, oh, I mean, most beautiful, but like on so many levels too. I also feel like if I tell her, you're beautiful, it's like that discounts all the other things you are because she's also the most smart. The yeah. you know, She's my rock. She's everything I do. Right. So to... to it's like reducing her to beauty seems insulting. Yeah, totally. So that sounds dumb to say, you're beautiful as an insult. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, no. this is, I overthink so many things. So that's oh, my gas station it. thing is like, I will talk to a stranger about, you know, fears and insecurities <laughs> you know, that we yeah. have, but not, you know, do you have Isn't children? Isn't that interesting, man? Um, interesting. It's, it's broken. I mean, well, <laughs> I'm a but, terribly broken person. Well, but I, I think, you know, artists, we, artists are probably quicker to admit our brokenness yeah. than other people, but, but it's just a reminder that we are all broken. Some sure. people are really good at masking it or filtering it or covering it up, yes, which true. is, I mean, which is the whole point of these conversations yes. is, you know. And I'm just vomiting insecurity and I'm, I don't want to <laughs> come across that this is who I am. I just feel like. This is a safe space for this, so yeah. I'm going to lean into it. Absolutely. So when I approach that table of strangers and I'm making balloons, yeah. I'm like, that's kind of where I feel like I can shine a bit because that awkward is kind of what I'm here for. Huh. Like, And I do have certain crutches. Like I'll go in, I feel like I will diffuse, I will find something as an opening topic, but then I'm ready within 30 seconds to take that person to a deep place in conversation they normally wouldn't have or think about. Yeah. Like a telephone pole sign that says your compliments are right. free and me saying, is this a cry for help? Is there some kind right. of urgency? <laughs> it's like, right. I'll have totally. that conversation with someone. Or I had this conversation with people about like someone wants a certain balloon cartoon character. Right. And we'll talk about how a 10 year old doesn't know who Bugs Bunny is anymore. But then we talked about a few years back, why kids would know who Betty Boop is right. or Pink Panther, but they won't know Charlie Brown. Right. And, and Some we will kids go like, can you make me a Kim Kardashian balloon? <laughs> right. And, we will go, and then I will take them into the place of, you know, like the YouTube generation, not in a get off my lawn place, but in a, right. um, it's like, yeah. And if they enjoy watching YouTube, we shouldn't say, you know, kids these days don't enjoy real entertainment. No, what we should say is we need to get into the mindset of there are no guilty pleasures. There are pleasures. And I think this generation's yeah. getting to that point. Um, oh, are you familiar with ASMR? Okay. Um, I think, are you familiar with slime videos or unboxing yeah, videos? Oh, yeah. oh yes, yes, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. We've gotten to the point where people can admit, right. it's like, I like the texture of right. this thing. I don't right. know why. Like the oddly satisfying yes. hashtag on That's Instagram. That's totally what like, I'm getting yeah. at with that. Um, and the unboxing is like, I don't know why I like this, but I do. We're getting to the point where you can just say, this is a pleasure. It's not a guilty pleasure. Right. Like, Okay, to be honest, I'm trying to think of like a guilty pleasure. <laughs> like I want to show my vulnerability if I'm exposing right, others. Right. It's like I'm sure there's a song that should be embarrassing. Uh, okay, uh, Psychedelic Furs, Pretty in Pink. Yeah, yeah, This yeah. is like an 80s song oh, that, totally, yeah. you know, you should totally make fun of me for liking that song. I do. Uh, yeah, um, shouldn't Shouldn't feel guilty about that. I was going to say a Taylor Swift song. I don't actually like right. a Taylor Swift song. <laughs> but if I did, it's like right. you shouldn't have to hide that. So well, I think it's great too that you're. I mean, the idea of showing vulnerability and embracing the awkwardness that we all have. I mean, life, life sure. is awkward. It is right. not set up for anyone to succeed in society, and yet, yes, and yet some people. It, I almost feel like the people who do succeed and look like they have it all together are less well less well adjusted than those of us who sometimes walk into rooms and go. Really, I really hope that like either no one talks to me or I find someone who likes balloons or comic books or, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Well, and I, I try to, this is my learning to be a human too, Yeah, is you have to stop. And I'm doing an interview about myself. So this is like so <laughs> ironic to say it's important to stop and stop, you know, using I statements or talking about yourself and ask about other people. Right. Because I'm approaching these tables. And first of all, I'm like, I have to explain what I'm doing. I do balloons and people ask how long have you been doing this? And right. I'm really into balloons and balloon art, the materiality of balloons, the idea behind the art, and also the um, the different lanes of artistic carpooling. Yeah. Like watercolor painting, I enjoy, I mean, not just doing it, I enjoy seeing, and you know, I enjoy, as we said, the abstract art. Right. I enjoy all of that kind of also through the lens of balloons. Everything goes through that filter of balloon art. But at the same time, oh, sorry, finish that tangent. 
I collect old balloons. I research the history of balloons. Oh, that's awesome. I <laughs> know that's broken too. It's like, no, I will. that's amazing. Like I love, I didn't even know there was like, you could collect old balloons. Like, no, you can't. That's why I do. Cause most <laughs> people would think like, Oh, they just one time use. Oh you know? uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> I love this. Okay. So keep me on this. Uh, do bring it. me back. Do it. Um, there are things I've spent money I didn't have and shouldn't have bought on eBay that I don't have places to keep yeah. and is li- literally gar- garbage. Like I will spend $60 on a box of balloons from the 1960s that are garbage because balloons break down. Right, they may the, be gummy. Yeah. You can never use them. Um, and I'm like, okay, or a bag of balloons. I'll never open the bag, but I'm saving them. I'm keeping them. I feel like exactly what you said. No one's saving them. Yeah. And they're disappearing. And no one's archiving the history of balloon art, and it's disappearing. Well, Some things I buy, it may be the only example left in the world of that particular item. Right. This, this week I'm at the House of Cards, the new magic spot right. down in Nashville. And they have, you know, kind of like the castle. They've got all these posters, and they've sure. got a pretty extensive collection of uh, vintage playing cards. Like right. They have a, a paper playing card from Germany from the year 1490. Okay. And I think it's amazing that like most people they would just go that's an old card. But you right. go this was not made to last. This was not you see a poster like if you see an original poster of Houdini, okay. you got to think they made that to hang outside the theater when he came to town. Yes. And it was going to end up in the garbage and it somebody hang, hung on to it and now it's art. Okay. Once again, no guilty pleasures, not bashing. If right. people who listen to this, if you collect those little pop figures, the bobbleheads, yeah. More power to you. Um, the whole difference here, and what you're saying, yeah. is things that you collect that were made to be a collector's item, right? Honestly, should not have collector's value. That's why your Beanie Baby stocks plummeted. Right? They were made to be collected. And they so made, things that they were made, made to be destroyed. Thousands of them. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, Superman number one comic book. The right. reason it is so valuable is because it was what, 1938, made during the Depression. Yeah. Little um, boys rolled them up, shoved them in their back pocket. Right. And also, like, comics were made from cheap paper, and then when we got into World War II, they were not made to last. There's, like, I think they went from two staples to one or three staples Uh to two, um, cheapest paper possible because there was a shortage. So people threw them away. That's why they're valuable because no one was saving them. It's like if you collect vintage bikes, boys' bikes are impossible Mm -hmm. to find because they destroyed them. (laughs) Yeah, and now when they're making, like, Either replicas or things that are made to be collected, like old Star Wars toys versus new ones. Right. Now they know you're not opening the box. Right. So why buy that? Right. Yeah. So I feel like it's kind of, I hate to say it's duty driven as well, but I do feel like no one's going to preserve your art. Now, that being said, there's five ish people I know of who are in the same boat. They're also collecting stuff. Yeah. And I also like within that, we have our own sub genres. I like collecting physical balloons. Okay. Um, Smarty Pants. Oh, I love this too. Also, you know how so many people oh, have a stage name. I love clown that, name, that our world Facebook is so name. like. I, <laughs> I just love that. Like, I tell people, I'm like, look, if you need a, a monkey or a unicycle or stilts, <laughs> I can get them to you within the hour. Sure. Like, yes, I, I don't have them, but I know a guy who right. knows a guy. <laughs> and it's funny when I say uh, Smarty Pants, like it's his name. I don't think that is his name, but uh, <laughs> like Buster Balloon, that's his legal name. Right. Several people have actually changed their names for what we do. And, like, I have a friend, uh, Archie Cobblepot. Yeah. I actually do know his real name right now. I didn't for so long. And he's yeah. one of the people that I said, you know, I absolutely will trust him with, you know, my social security number, my bank card, everything. Yeah. You know, I trust him more than almost anyone in the world and didn't know his real name. That's and wild. then when I did find out his real name, I'm like, I'm going to forget that because it's, like, information that, you know, yeah. you don't need. To, it's like, I know, you know, Banksy's name, you know. It's right. like, but do we care? Do we need to know it? No, right. we don't no. because that's not who he is. Um, so yeah, uh, <laughs> tangent off that. So Smarty Pants collects like old balloon books, instructional material, video stuff yeah. like that. Um, I think Rob collects balloons too. It's like we all have our own certain thing that we collect. So that was a long way to go to say I collect old balloons. <laughs> okay. Okay. Bringing this back. Bringing this back. Yeah. 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 So with that conversation, I can have it at a table. If someone starts me, I can have a 20 minute conversation about balloons, hopefully make it more interesting than nerdy. Yeah. You know, like when you talk to that Star Wars guy and you don't care about the ins and outs of, you right. know, how the prequels mean this or whatever. It's like, I don't want to be that guy, but I'm like, everything out there should have a documentary and you can find an interesting angle. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm like, there's a point where you need to learn to shut up. Yeah. Because all these people that I see every night, I don't want to just go table to table and say, 
I'm interested in here is why. It's like right. these people come from all walks of life, and they all are individual people with fully realized characters. They're not three minutes in your life. They're a full lifetime right, that you get buddy. to experience. Yeah. So sometimes it's hard to not see outside yourself because we're very egotistical p- humans, not magicians. Totally. <laughs> I mean, double for magicians. Double sure. for magicians. But... <laughs> Calm down, guys. You're finding playing cards. Uh, You're not doing amazing. No, dude. I, I make balloon animals for a living. I'm very self-aware. I will make fun of myself twice as hard as you can make fun of me, by all means. Um, but the thing is, when you let people talk about this, I started to notice that these aren't... You think of other people as like, you work nine to five, you go into an office, you're in a cubicle, you leave. Right. That's like that's like saying everyone's named John Doe. Right. Um, any given night, I will meet like an international pilot who like flies over the ocean all the time, and that's their normal. That's fascinating to me. Yeah, it's like I, I was listening to a podcast. Um, gosh, I don't know which one. I listen to a lot of podcasts. Of course, shout out to your podcast. <laughs> wow, it's always good we plug the podcast that we're on while they're listening. <laughs> no, did you notice how I was doing the smooth segue, but then I like had to stop and like Apologize. punch everyone in the face for it too. <laughs> It's like, this is so smooth, I have to break it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's how we but, uh, make entertainers, guys. That's how we do. Nice. Um, um, anyway. Oh, you, you were saying, like, but, yeah, like a pilot. Like, the thing that is their normal day job is fascinating, fascinating yeah. to everyone else. Oh, and I to just not just be so in your head of what you do and, you know, look how amazing I am, but to get into their world. Yeah, let me just touch this one real quick because this blew my mind. Um, and then, This might have been This American Life. It might have not been. I don't know if it was a mainstream. No, I know what it was now. They were interviewing a um, an astronaut yeah. who did not land on the moon, but I think was the first person to leave the orbit and okay. went around the moon. Did not care. He was a test pilot, and this was a job for him. And people would be like, "But was it cool to be weightless?" He was like, "It was interesting for fifteen seconds. It was his job." And it's so hard to wrap your mind around so that funny. being like so normal. Yeah, and it's fun because so many people think that what they do is boring, and so and good, boring buddy. is so much amazing. Yes. And I, I'm not saying that in that kind of, you know, oh, gosh, let's all stop and, you know, think that things are more beautiful than they are. No, I mean, in the most sincere way, boring is very amazing. And to the point, too, this is my being broken. I think boring is so much more amazing than the things that we're supposed to be amazed by. Right. The spectacular stuff that really is kind of leaves you empty afterward. Right. And I hate that I'm doing this, but I no. need to show you. I Phone video. I love it. This is the most visual audio podcast we've ever hey, had. Scott. I am fully aware of the, uh, <laughs> my stupid approach to this. And no. hey, you said you edit your podcast. I do. Wink and um, and begging here. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is great. I will. I will. Any anything that all I ask is anything that you're showing me. I'd love to be able to share a couple of these so that we can. Oh, you people can abs- experience it. Um, uh, said complete vulnerability. I want to be that. So. I may not think to offer something, so ask I'll, me if I forget. Yeah, I'll text oh, you. Oh, awesome. This is going to be a tangent, so if you're cutting stuff out, this may totally be cut out. <laughs> what? <laughs> Yo, know, preface, preface, preface. Um, I'm scrolling through here, and I saw a, uh, a video I took, and I'm wearing a Jawbreaker shirt. Yeah. Okay, so Jawbreaker is my favorite band of all time by far. Yeah. And I actually, they broke up 96, I believe, and it was one of those, like, atomic bomb, terrible divorce, we'll never get back together type breakups. Yeah, they were like, we're done. And then they did. Ah. Like a year ago, yeah. like someone did a documentary on them and they actually got them in the same room and yeah. they were like listening to the old masters and the people <gasps> are together for the first time forever. Yeah. And like, you know, we have a guitar in the other room if you want to go and see no it. Way. And um, lead singer was like, no, I'm not interested. So I'm watching that, I'm like, Oh, so if there was ever any hope, there's not. <laughs> it's gone. And then they uh, got back together, actually saw them in Austin with the motiv- most beautiful girl in the world I was saying earlier. Um, <laughs> like the second best experience in my life. First best is also with her, but also personal. And I'm not going <laughs> to bore you friend. <laughs> okay. It's, it was six hour, hour therapy session is what it was. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say that because I didn't want to say, not a vulgar thing. Right. Right. <laughs> Mind out the gutter, guys. Um. <laughs> But anyway, so before I saw them live, they uh, they did a they screened the documentary and they had two of the band members for a Q and A afterwards. Yeah, and so I had a question for them. But at the same time, I was like, okay, before I have to like do that, I don't want to be the guy that says, "Oh, I love everything you've done. You mean so much to me." Right. Because a you do have to do that. Right. B they hear it all the time. C they're probably bored of hearing it. Right. But I had to like phrase that a certain way. And what I said to them is. 
you know, being the soundtrack to my life for, uh, gosh, 92, 93, don't make me do the math, over 20 years, quarter of a century, wow. <laughs> um, I said, you know, I've bought all your records, uh, we've had... 20 years of one-way conversations you don't know I exist, wow. which is cool. Um, but it's like, I need to thank you because I know that is a one-way conversation and you're not hearing each individual person you're touching. Right. And I want to bring that back around too because as entertainers, we're having one-way conversations with everybody. Now, we do right. have volunteers and we do interact with people. But if you're doing a show, like when you perform, what's your average crowd size to put you on the spot? Uh, it varies. Probably 75, 100. Okay, so there is like logistically no way you can talk to everybody. Even no. a high five on the way out, you can't yeah, do. No. So yeah, that's uh, that one way conversation, and that's I mean that's just the way things are. And we but, never we never know the impact. Like you said, you don't know if you're yeah. if you don't get to be part of the conversation they have in the car on the way home. Oh right, and you know that <laughs> actually you bring up a great point. You hear stories every now and then that one person you didn't think that you touched, and you know right. that's what a viral Facebook video of course is or oh, a meme totally. or a post because yeah, 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 yeah. you hear about that one story okay screw that one story that does not matter what does matter is the 99 percent of the stories that are below that level but above the other level it's mm. like when you kind of made that difference um like if there are 10 influences that made you the performer you are today right like one of those influences is super important yeah or the person who influenced that person. So anyway, yeah, that was <laughs> the jawbreaker tangent. Okay, the video I wanted to show you is, I think, on this phone. And, yeah. And I'm sorry to do the whole... I okay, love this. I need to stop saying I'm sorry. Don't say I had, I've had several people get on to me about apologizing all the time. I, You know, it took me several years to... And I still do it <laughs> from time to time. But I... I would be in very fun places yeah. apologizing that I was invited to be there. <laughs> yeah. Be like, come on. I, I just want to make sure that I'm not coming across as the person who's like trying to sound no. authentically like these things. No, buddy. There's there's no... Uh, this is the only... This is probably the time that you get to talk about yourself <laughs> and it's not... It, 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 this is the episode about you. Okay. <laughs> you know? So if you can... Uh, Trying to think, what is the most beautiful animation you have seen? Oh gosh, any Pixar movie lately? Oh yeah, I always go to Fantasia because yeah. I feel like Fantasia was the top animators at the top of their game, doing something that had never been done before. Right. And uh, if I could, if there are any balloon people listening, if I can like give any advice at all on being a good balloon person, yeah, the thing that will make your balloon art better is if you watch one less balloon video and watch Fantasia one more time. Oh, that's good, man. Yeah, and. <laughs> Just I don't it. want that to sound elementary, but right. it's it's about getting out of being so insular. Yeah. But to see the top per top group of people at the top of their craft doing right. something that's not the best they can do, but better than yep. conceivably the best is amazing. Oh, totally. Now I take that. Um, Fantasia was big to me. I actually watched it again recently. Yeah. Um, I love that there's no words, and I can do that like while I'm doing yep. something else. Yep. This is a dirty dish that I took a video of. I don't know if yeah. you can see this. I don't even know what's swirling in that water. Oh, my goodness. It looks amazing, though. <laughs> but I'm like... Talk about oddly satisfying. <laughs> I know. I'm totally being a slime on YouTube video person. No, this is... A, we're looking at a dish. It's it's a dish with water in it. Maybe it was some old pasta sauce or it something. It has to be Who something oil-based for the way it's Yeah, but swirling. it is dancing and moving. Very, yeah. very Fantasia-esque. I may actually warn you about swiping left or right on that phone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and there's a stir with the fork. But to say that a rainbow is supposed to be beautiful, I mean, right. that's, guys, that's the lowest hanging of fruit. The things that aren't supposed to be beautiful. Right. Like, I know everyone knows what I'm talking about when I say this. You know, when you go out after a rain and, you know, there's still water on the ground, but it's not raining. You look up, you see the rainbow, that's beautiful. Yeah. You look down, you see all the like rainbows of like the oil and gasoline that kind of collects yep. in puddles. Yeah. Why should that be any less magical? Huh. I mean, it should be more because the rainbow is kind of peacocking. Hey, look at me! Right, it's kind of like the um, the dirty, beautiful art that isn't appreciated should be more appreciated. Oh, I don't know if that makes sense. Okay, I love it. Let me bring this so back much. around. Yeah. Um, the painting downstairs that I am buying the, when we figure out how to buy it. Right, <laughs> I'm going in two places with this. So go for it. Okay, first of all, bring me back to us being entertainers too. Yep. Um, you're an artist, a performance artist, magician, performance yep. is art. Anyone who's listening to this who says that you're an artist, 
you need to have original art in your house somewhere. Mm. If you go to Pier 1 and you buy that like silk screened rep- reproduction of art right. that is like stapled to, you know, look like artwork. Right. There's no soul to that. Yep. Um you actually need to support another artist. And I'm not saying that, you know, altruistic purposes. Uh, Zig Ziglar at one point said when he was a uh, door-to-door salesman, he was selling pots and pans. Right. And he talked to another person who was having a hard time, you know, with door-to-door sales. And he's like, well, do you own these pots and pans? He's like, no, I can't afford it. He's like, neither could I. And I bought them. Because if you don't believe in it enough, how can you sell it to someone else? Right, right. If you don't buy original artwork, how are you going to sell yourself as an artist to someone else? Yes. So uh, that's, you know, why I want to buy this painting downstairs. Um. I looked in diff- different places to meet you for this. Yeah. And one of the places, and I felt like this would have sounded weird on the surface, there's an alley in the kind of not shady part of town, but it's yeah. like by a, a uh, junkyard. Yeah. And I thought, that's a weird place to meet a stranger for a podcast. It's <laughs> more where I would, I would meet you to sell down. meth or something, I would have right? been so down. Okay. <laughs> well, here's the reason. Um, one of my two favorite local artists, and then he actually moved to uh, Asheville, North Carolina, and it yeah. Really sucks because, you know, we need him here. Um, uh, his name's Ryan McCauley. Total shout out to him. He should, he'll probably never hear this, and we rarely communicate at yeah. all in any way. He was a graffiti artist, and he also would like do like acrylic paintings on canvas too. But yeah. with that, bringing that graffiti, like that hand, that fingerprint we talked about before, that touch, that um, handwriting. Yep. Um, to it is he would build his own canvas but he would also like put those like extra little touches into the texture of the painting so at a time when i really couldn't afford it and this was like a time when we would always have like 12 dollars in our bank account and yeah. not and if a check doesn't come within three days we can't right. afford rent yeah i bought I a 300 hundred dollar painting it, from him which <laughs> at the same time during that time, yeah. I uh, actually did the thing where I would put $5 aside in tips I would make every night yep. into a secret pocket to make a secret fund and bought this painting I couldn't afford and shouldn't have bought. Yeah. And it's in my room now. It's like one of my favorite things. Because you have to support the art. Um, I have a few of his other paintings right now, and I was thinking this morning I need to find something and like, yeah. <laughs> like get something else from this guy. The alley I wanted to meet you in, yeah. it's a... It's a uh, roughly horseshoe kind of alley behind some buildings that fit together in a way to make an alcove. Yeah. And I don't know where this idea came from, but he does like artwork, like wheat pasting, like you would wheat paste up the old magician's posters. Yeah. You know yeah, how yeah. they'd oh, like yeah. be glued to a wall. Yeah. Instead of going into a gallery, he did his own gallery show in an alley. And he, I think the title was, you shouldn't be here. And it was like behind oh, wow. a, like a falling down barbed wire fence. So he yeah. hand painted on like, I don't know what kind of paper, but large paper, like 12 different original paintings. We pasted that to the wall and then put like little museum cards, yeah. like the size of the painting, the title, etc. And the whole idea is you go there and it's like where homeless people would sleep because you're stepping over broken bottles and like, you know, KFC wrappers, stuff like that, which right. also adds to the vibe. You're not in a white cube like a museum. Yeah. But it's like, it's kind of like graffiti art. He's got paintings of people climbing water towers and stuff like that. So it's all part of the vibe. And he did this knowing that the painting will be temporary. It's going to rain and, you know, right. it's peeling it's off. Away, yeah. um, and I love that so much. And I think I went there like five times. It's like I would like drive out of my way, go there at, you know, two in the morning in the dark when there's probably people sleeping and, you know, the, right. uh, the weeds that are growing around there. Because it was like such an amazing thing. And to me, it's like, oh, gosh, that's way above spending 12 hours decorating a box. That's like, wow, what? is in his head to drive that passion to... I mean, first of all, you think, this is a project, I should do it. Okay, right. the thing I hate the most yeah. is when people say, somebody should do this. And you're like, you could do this, but you're saying somebody should. Right, right. Nobody will unless somebody does. Yeah, so, that's so it's like, good, I want to know what's in his head that like went from that point to like the last second of posting that last poster up there. Yeah. So like, those are the people that inspire me the most. It's so amazing so and it's such a challenge to artists who are listening right now who who i mean we we all do this with different projects or ideas where we go uh, i should do that or someone should do that right. and we don't and at a certain point it's like well just get started i mean like you yes. said with the boxes you started with a little doodle and then it got more right. and more and now there's people displaying these things and sharing them with others and mm-hmm. and if you would have never taken the time to do it no one would have ever experienced that you sure. know, 
And I can't say what drives art. Uh, some of that is mysterious to me, but I feel like once you start the project, there is something that pushes you through. And I feel like I need to differentiate here. It's not like you need to do something to be different or like trying to be weird for weirdness sake or yeah. how can I be original? I don't think any of what he did could have come from those places because what would have fueled, if that was the motivation, it would have burned out before the project was finished. Right. And it's like, you can tell this was that like deep inside passion project. It's yep. like that primal scream. If I have to do this thing. Yeah. And like, that is the most interesting place. <sighs> Not like, you know, someone decided they wanted to sell a print of something. So they you know, did a drawing. Right. It's like, there's not real, there's some soul in that. I don't want to discount any art. Right. But you can feel that sincerity. Yeah. Especially to put that much in time into something right. that's, that, that is going to be temporary. Okay. You know? Okay. It's put up or shut up time. Let's get back. Entertaining. Entertaining. We're <laughs> You're entertainers. asking, is a bad show good art? Yeah. And I start off by saying, I don't know. And I kind of want to see what that means to me. Yeah. I think I have to ask what a bad show is. is yeah. It, I, I'm going to say the yes and no. And it all goes down to intent. If you tried and you had a bad show, yeah, that is acceptable. Failure is acceptable if you try. If you don't try and you fail, then that's that's really just not acceptable. Right. And I think like a lot of art is a choice. It's not always binary. It's like, do I leave this out? Do I put this in? But there are some sorts of choices. A performance is based on choices too. Right. Every word you choose can be intentional. The structure of your show, the order of routines, volunteers. There are so many choices. Making a bad choice is fine. Not making a choice is not fine. Right. The lack of intentionality is not okay. Intentionality is okay, even if it was wrong. Because mm. a show, I guess, is a living creature. It's not that you're not recording straight to vinyl right. album, right? So yeah, it I, learns to evolve. It needs to it evolve grows. and grow, yeah. I, I think for me, probably, if I'm trying to think without saying names of you know shows I've seen that I would consider a bad show or a bad magician per se, it would be someone who is, who is not present. <laughs> you know what I mean? No. They're, and, and they're not aware. They're not aware of the quality of their show and they're not doing anything to change it. You know, they bought a trick, they do the words that come in the instructions of the trick and they have no desire to change or grow or tweak or originate, but they can get paid to go do Basically, you get paid to go show someone else's art off yes. with less quality. <laughs> okay. I want to argue that point, not to be argumentative or because no, I feel please. the opposite, but I do feel like this is the everyone deserves a lawyer, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I have to say the reason that bad art is okay is that those people are stunted artistically. Hmm. I don't mean that to sound insulting. It is insulting. Right. But I feel like that person maybe didn't have the right motivation, the right push, or their intent or motivation is not in alignment with what they're doing. Yeah. And I want to say, too, if if you're in this business to make a buck, you can, you do, many people do. I can't say that's right or wrong. I can't say, no, get out of this and get a day job or dig ditches. Right, right. Because I don't own art. I don't own magic. I don't own balloons. So uh, I can't say, I mean, to be fair, I am part of the temporary caretaker for art. Right. Um, everything I do is built on people that came before me. Like I want to name names. There's so many, but like right. if it wasn't for Henry Marr inventing balloon art, if it wasn't for uh, David Grist showing us what could be done, Ralph Dewey, um, I started and I want to name like yeah, 300 no. names. Otherwise I'm in trouble. But if it wasn't for the people who did this before, we would have nothing. Right. And if we want to... There's a fine line between being protective and I guess being paranoid. <laughs> yeah. Well, sure. But you don't want to say, no, you can't have the secrets because you want to save it for yourself and be selfish. Right, right, right. But the thing is, there's going to come the time when, you know, you're going to give your possessions away and you lie down and die. You know, it's yeah. like you have to have a living will. Right. And I'm actually at that point with my life. Okay. I'm not saying I'm dying. <laughs> that was all metaphorically. But I realized... I'm never going to be the best balloon artist in the world. And I am perfectly fine with that. Mm. Younger me would have cringed at the thought because I start off as a juggler and juggling is standing in one place for right. six to eight hours a day or how I used to do it. 
you throw things up in the air, you drop them, you pick them up, you fill them up again, right. bang your head against the wall for hours after hours, day after day, because you want to be the best. I realize my role is not to be the best, but my role is to help other people be the best, to see, I don't know if it's like what they, I don't want to say what people can't see, that's very pretentious, but I can like identify ways to shave hours off of learning curves. Right. And like, I know things that I could have done differently that would have absolutely helped me out in right. hindsight. Like before Judd Lane, I was into skateboarding for like 15 years. Yeah. Never did anything with it professionally. It was kind of my outlet. Yeah. I mean, actually, lineage for me is skateboarding turned into Judd Lane, turned into balloons and is what I'm doing now. Yeah. It's really all the same thing in my mind. It's the stubborn persistence of hour after hour banging your head against the wall, full submersion into a thing, never not being in it. Which I think is where my sincerity with this stuff comes from. Right. In hindsight, if I could go back and tell that person about body mechanics, about your mm. center of gravity, about how your shoulders and hips affect the way you turn, yeah, that would have shaved like months off of try the same thing twelve, you know, twelve hundred times and wonder why you didn't get a different result. Right. So I'm like, if I can do that with anyone doing balloons now, yeah, that's totally what I should be doing. Oh, that's so. So. Good. All that being said, yeah, we are caretakers, so we don't own this. So I can't tell someone it's wrong for you to buy an invisible deck and go make money at it. Right. Where it is wrong is, I guess, when they are undercutting other entertainers. Right. Because that come, that's that's a whole different discussion. That's yeah. versus hurting the art. That's hurting the livelihood of other artists, which I guess does hurt the art. Yeah. That's a, I love that you describe it as we're caretakers of it. We don't own mm. it. And... There's a responsibility that comes with that to be oh, yeah. generous, to be generous not only to what we give the audience, but what we give the other performers. Oh, yeah. And uh, Caretakers, too, though, does mean you have to defend it, you have to take care of it, and sometimes you have to be mother bear about it. Right. So, I mean, and that should come from passion. I have a friend, uh, Christopher Lyle, shout him out here, too. Um, he wears his passion um, more visibly than a lot of other people. Yeah. And in Facebook groups, people think that he's like, he can be loud, he can be abrasive. And, yeah, he can be, but... Yeah. You have to understand that comes from the passion and the protectiveness. It's not yeah. from him like wanting to be combative or having a great time about it. Yep. It's, I mean, I love that he can like be triggered and flip and go after something like just like a bull in a china shop, just, you know, tearing stuff down. Yeah. That comes from deep passion. And don't we all wish we had that kind of deep passion? Oh, totally. So... Yeah. Um, I don't want to say we're caretakers, so let's all be passive. Right. We're caretakers, right, right. so... We need to, you know, help this baby grow and, you know, be better afterwards. That's so stinking good, man. I want to actually, I'm going to say I'm straight up stealing this because this is something that hit me and influenced me in a really uh, beautiful way. Yeah. So not my idea, but I was listening to a different podcast. Yeah. <laughs> how many times can I say that? Oh, that's great. Um, and this guy was describing how he was really into biology in school and uh -huh. now he's into creativity, motivation, and art. Yep. And he said he was applying the rules of biology to art. Huh. And something that biologists or scientists have to do is, and this sounds very basic, but you have to have structure. Yeah. Determine if a thing is alive or not. Yeah. And when you think about that, it's like determining if Pluto is a planet. You yeah. have to have rules. Otherwise, you know, there is no way to build a, a table or a structure of everything else. Right. So they say to uh, show that something is alive, it has to be, does it... Um, does it grow? Does it um, reproduce? Does it move? Right. We say like one of the things that a living thing has to do is grow. Otherwise, it's not alive. That's right. why we can say like a tree is alive. We don't see it, you know, physically move, but right. it but fits the know. criteria. Yeah. There's... Right. So without that, you know, is this coral actually alive? You know, that's one of the ways we can determine. So we said your art, whatever that is, whether that's like tangible art, physical art, performance art. If it's a living thing, it has to grow. Right. If it doesn't grow, it's not a living thing and it's dead. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the only way to say, you know, you can't fall into that rut of I've been doing the same show 10 years, never change anything. Yeah. It's like, sometimes you need to have the black and white, you know, trigger words of, is your art dead? To right. say, no. I mean, I've been doing the same show because I'm kind of burnt out. And then you're thinking, oh, when you frame it that way. Right. Oh, totally. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and you wonder how guys who are amazing performers mm -hmm. lose their passion or they get yeah. tired or they end up, you know. Uh, one of the saddest things to me is seeing someone that I respected and still respect, but 
loved oh. their show 30 years ago and you see them now they're doing the same 15 minutes and they don't have the passion anymore oh could yeah. that be i mean that could be so many things it could also be they've done this their whole life and don't know what to do now. It could right. be like when the NFL player retires and you wake up one morning. <laughs> or, oh, the worst thing is if an NFL player is injured and like 30 seconds later, you're like, oh, I don't know how the world works or what my place right. oh, yeah. is in the universe. So I don't know if maybe that person is like the child actor or whatever and you're like, I don't know how to, how to do anything else. So that's what they're still doing. Yeah. But maybe, do you think maybe that they're trying to give the audience what they think the audience wants? The audience is disappointed because the entertainers not giving them what they want, and oh. there's some kind of like terrible cycle. Possibly, or am I just over analyzing no, this possibly. like a sign I mean, on a, a I, I've thought of, post? No, I've thought about it because you have these guys who were like cutting edge. They came up with this act, and you know, yeah. The, I think part of it is the danger of success. Once you once you develop an act that can make money and you can tour the world with it and you can be busy for 15, 20 years, I think there's a certain level of comfort that comes from not being so hungry. Yeah, and if they that, don't play Freebird, yeah, the audience you know is what upset. I mean? sure. And so uh, I think if, I've seen it happen with musicians or magicians as well where uh, it's it took them 10 years to develop that act and they don't really have the hunger to develop a new one because they can keep doing this one and keep getting paid. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But man, yeah. this has been beautiful. How how can people see what you're doing? How can they get a hold of you or know that there's different things you got going on? Do you want uh do you do the social media thing? Do you want to put that out there? <laughs> um the YouTube video we've done, we're on six years. We might be heading into seven six. So with that show, I made this intentional decision that at first I'm like, we're going to do it weekly because that sounds terrifying. Sounds yeah. like too much work. Right. It'll be fun. Let's do it. Let's hurt ourselves. Yeah. Um, I decided I did not want to monetize it or have ads. Yeah. There's that thing in my head. I'm like, I don't want to make my friends sit through a 30 second Massengill ad so I can make two cents. <laughs> it's like, I wanted it to be free. I, right. I, it's like, I almost wanted that like the prize in the cereal box to be so much better than the cereal. Yeah, it's kind of, buddy, I like the bonus, great. the bonus. So I, I wanted it to be free. Like intentionally, I wanted money out of my pocket for it. Right. Um, and I did have to have someone send me straight after a while. And we did wind up doing a thing where there's still no ads, but we have Patreon, which to me is like, oh, if someone great. wants to help, they can, yeah. but we don't. What's, what's the Patreon? How do people find it? So I think we're at patreon.com yep. slash purple pig. Awesome. Color purple. Um, Animal pig. Yeah. So, yeah, I try to do a lot of things backwards. I feel like the sincerity, the intentionality, I, I try to divorce it so much from the money right. that I overcorrect and go too far the other way. Yeah. So, like, some of these packages, I'm sending out the postage is more than the price the of something I sell, that kind of thing. Yep. So, that's why I'm not, I wasn't ready to plug stuff. Um, right. So, I wanted to do this. Everyone has this thing growing up, you're supposed to rebel against your parents, hate your parents, and then you grow older and you like realize, right. I never really saw what you were doing for me. Um, I had that going on with my dad and I have, I have to shout him out here. Yeah. I keep saying that I do what I do for a living because like my dad was a construction worker, a roofer, um, in Nashville, like it's really hot during the summer and he would be on an asphalt roof where like the temperature is always plus 15, plus 20 degrees. Right, yeah. And when I was 10 years old, you know, 12 years old, whatever, he would bring us with him and we'd work on the roof and I'd be like, I hate this so much. And I, I used to joke, that's my motivation for doing this for a living. I don't want to work on roofs. Right. I don't want to do construction. And it took me years to realize as it does, that's how, you know, parent child works. You know, I've got right. my own daughter right now and I see the same thing that I'm way more like my dad than I ever wanted to admit. Wow. But what happened is he lived in Nashville his whole life. I live here, you know, I've lived here most of my life is I can drive around Nashville or anywhere within a 50 mile radius. And he can, you know, point and say, uh, put the roof on that house or he knows the street names or I helped wow. build this building or, you know, I poured the concrete for this patio and it hit me. It's like, I'm not trying to get away from doing what he did. I do the exact same thing my dad did, but with different materials. Oh, wow. That was like one of those, you know, like, ooh, lightning yeah. strike kind of you know, shiver moments. It's like, yeah. damn it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I did do what he's doing. But it was also kind of like the, um, you know, I appreciate that so much. So it's amazing how we we don't appreciate the journey until we see it as adults, you know, and we see some of the things that didn't make sense to us as kids and we go, Oh, 
that explains that. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I want to thank everyone who's helped me out along the way. There's no possible way to do that. Yeah. The, uh, the circus people, you know who you are, you know, you're my people. Um, everyone else who's believed in me. Now there are a few people out there too. I guess there's like a Todd Newfeld. I don't know if you're listening or not, or, <laughs> or my mom. And I put both of them in the same category, which sounds weird. It makes sense <laughs> in my head. It makes no sense coming out of my mouth. Let me explain that now. They fall in a category where I think they believe more in me than they should. Mm. So my motivation is, I guess, to like live up to what people say about you. Yeah. I'm trying to think of the right way to articulate that. Yeah. Well, like, it's like if someone shows you support, you feel is undue. Right. It's like, it's like that makes me want to be the better person to be the person who you think I am. Yeah. There's a sign outside that says, be the person your dog thinks you are. <laughs> totally. Yeah. That. <laughs> so I just, there's this Facebook post about people who inspire you and like different people are shouting out their friends and their friends are like, Hey, thanks. It's great to see my name in here. I'm like, I think what it is, is if you see someone like, I actually kind of had this fear first. It's like, don't say my name. Don't say my name. Don't right. say my name. Then I see my name. I'm like, okay, that's fearful and terrifying. But what that means is now I feel like you've given me this banner and I have to like not make you a liar. If that makes right. sense. It's like that puts the onus on me. And I know how that comes from a weird backwards place, but yeah. we're motivated by different things and I'm motivated by, okay, <laughs> we're wrapping up still, but I agree. Uh, my friend who I said is the uh, fight club guy, we're opposite. Right. And I'll tell him this, this, you know, he'll admit this first of all, we're motivated opposite. Um, everything he does and he'll say is awesome. He's great in awesomeness. And you know, he's his own biggest champion. And I'm not saying that to like bust him. It's right. like, he'll totally say that. It's like, yeah. you got to believe in yourself. Otherwise who will. Right. I'm the opposite. Nothing I've ever done is good enough, huh. but I'm not saying that like from a negative standpoint, I'm like, that's the reason I want to do better work. If uh, I felt the work I did was good enough, why would right. I improve it? I would just keep doing the same thing. I would be the guy you're describing 30 years later doing the same work. Right. So I don't want people to think when I say something that sounds like I'm beating myself up or I'm negative, that that's why. Yeah. It's like, no, that being angry or negative at myself is what makes me better. And I think I, sometimes I will rant on other balloon people or performers and I'll be like, you know, this demanding you're called a balloon artist isn't right. You can't demand to be called an artist. You earn art, you know, the title of artist, you right. know, and I'll like have these moments of just ranting and bashing us. That is that kind of like tough love is like, we, I gotta, you know, drag us through the fire because you have to be uncomfortable with what you do. Cause if you're uncomfortable in your chair right now, you're going to move. Right. Um, so if we're going to have a movement, if we're going to move forward, you have to make yourself uncomfortable. In my mind, that's my motivation. Yeah. So it's like... It's not always pushing away those feelings, but going, okay, yeah. what? You know, it's like if you burn your hand on the stove, you feel the pain, so you move, you yeah. know? And I, I, I do know I, I overcorrect. I need to change some of that because people say, you know, take a damn compliment, which I can't. <laughs> but I'm like... And, and the thing, I, and if someone does compliment me, I have to be like, well, actually, the the way you see it that way is because, or I right. I can't take credit for that. Right. But I, I don't want to make it sound as because I'm insecure. All right, we're all insecure. But no, that's the motivation to keep moving forward. That's awesome, man. As we wrap up, I, I, I've got to ask you at least one question to turn go, the tables in a weird oh, way. Go, go ahead. And this is putting you on the spot. And this isn't just to be stupid, but it's like, I'm actually legitimately curious. Yeah. Um. You know how people say, you know, failure is the best thing, fell forward fast, you know, failure is what strengthens you, makes you grow. Yeah. And um, sometimes I'll have just even one word in my head or a theme. Or when I go into the restaurant tonight, I may have a phrase that's stuck in my head and I don't know why, huh. but that will come out in a way. Like the other day, maybe two weeks ago, just the word almost in my head, okay. which it's like, well, what does that mean? How is that going to make a balloon figure materialize with the thought process? Yeah. Um, I was thinking in the in the movie you see the uh, the superhero the uh, I don't know James Bond or whoever is like he's shooting and kills like forty bad guys or whatever and then he's running down an alley the other guy's a machine gun he's shooting he gets away yeah you never see almost in the movie you don't see like right you're thirty minutes in and one bullet happens to catch him in the neck and he dies right because that's not how movies work obviously no but the whole concept of almost is we live in almost yeah but we don't share stories of almost. Mm. Um, so actually that night, the sculpture I came up with was the, uh, it was like two basketball players and it was basically, it was missing the winning shot at the final buzzer because we don't tell that story. 
Huh. We tell the 1% story. We don't tell the 99%. Right. So it's, I'm saying all that to say the phrase I've had going on in my head lately um, that I'm working through today is that whole idea of failure is good. Failure is what strengthens you. And I'm trying to understand why I'm asking myself questions sometimes. Yeah. So to ask you like the most vulnerable question and, you know, decline if you want, cut this out, edit if you don't want no, it. Can you like personally think of like a failure you don't know that you grew from? And it, you can keep this. It doesn't have to be like personal, just like performing a show that went wrong, oh, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, uh, so many of them. Um, <laughs> I mean, just <laughs> just one in general. I, if it's one that you don't no, like, a, ma- a major one was I gave up performing for an entire year. Okay, I just stopped. I shut it down. Took down my website. Changed mm-hmm. my phone number. Gave away six months worthy of gigs to friends. Um, at the time, I was working a day job and never wanted to be in that industry and felt this pressure of like just doing what other people wanted me to do. And, uh, and, and, and I just gave it up, man. I sold all my props. Like I did, I just gave up the whole thing and I didn't perform for a year. And a year later, I quit the day job and went full time. Uh-huh. And, um, and I've, I've often wondered like, is that a failure? Is the failure the moment that I took that job and didn't do performing, which I knew I was supposed to do since the time I was eight years old? Um, hmm. Or or is that one of those things where you go, man, if I never would have done that, I never would have really... Because when I when I let it go for that time, it was interesting. When I came back to it, all this stuff that I was so worried about before of losing it or having people think I was crazy or all this stuff. It was like all that stuff was gone because I had already given it up once. So there's something interesting about giving it up and picking it back up. That So maybe that's not a failure. Maybe that's just a learning moment. Dude, thanks, thanks for, for opening all this. that up to me. Yeah, and I'm glad that we're we're connected. Let's it's thank just, Rob because this wouldn't this have happened without Rob all because of Rob Balchunas and it Absolutely. is a... It's just, a, it points to how weird and wonderful our life is that you yeah. have friends that just go, hey, you you both would get along. <laughs> Let me tell you. And then you're in a coffee shop in a random city that, you know. Here's what's so amazing. And I will stop talking eventually. <laughs> oh my God, my microphone's no, not plugged in. Okay, love- no. um, <laughs> okay, so I keep shouting out the same people over and over. I hope they don't think, you know, hey, you keep talking about me. Um, I I was meeting some uh, balloon people. Uh, I think a few people I had never met before. And yeah. we were in a state neither one of us lived in. We went to Florida, you know, neutral territory. And we're talking. And I was hearing them talk about someone. And, you know, after a few sentences, it's like, like coincidence, coincidence, coincidence. Okay, we're talking about the same person. Yeah. Um. So these were two performers from Los Angeles, I believe. Okay. And they were talking about Scott Neri. Yeah. And it's like, I'm a balloon person from Nashville who really has not left Nashville before. Yeah. And it was weird to say, oh yeah, Scott Neri and I were roommates for years. Yeah. Because we're like people who had no right on earth to know each other. Yeah. And these like weird um, spider webs of connections occur yeah. to say, hey, person from Los Angeles, I'm meeting you in Florida. I'm from Nashville. Yes, I know Scott Neri from Ohio. You know, it's yeah. it's like that chance meeting in an airport and meeting someone who knows your dad. Right. You're like, what are the chances of that? Yeah. Um, but it's beautiful, isn't it? How those oh, yeah. connections come. And I, I, I just think it's so fun. Like and I met I met Rob through other guys and through Scott Show Booby Trap and so but I knew the second he goes, Hey, you're in Nashville, I know someone you should talk to, I was right. like, Let's do this. Like <laughs> Oh, that's beautiful. You know? too. It's like you can go to any city in the world and like have someone who will put you on their couch. Right, exactly. <laughs> it's like, I don't know you. I don't know if you have a criminal history. <laughs> I trust you. <laughs> That's beautiful. Man. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> uh, if anyone passes through my town now, I have to think. Right. Hmm, did you listen to this podcast? <laughs> this guy's an easy mark. Go to the show notes. We put the code awesome. to his front door on there. <laughs> <laughs> right. Hey, well, look at yeah. See the uh, packages. They have yeah, my return address. Go, yeah. Do go on. Go on the show notes if you're listening right now, and uh, you can see all this the art. I'm going to take a picture of this that you gave me in this book, and we'll put it up there. I'm yeah. so grateful that you would take the time. Guys, go check out Scott. And uh, yeah, man, I'm going to turn this off, but we can keep talking. Sure.